Well, good morning, everybody, and on behalf of the Vicar and the PCC of St. Peter Mancroft, a very warm welcome to you to our first of our Heritage Open Week talks. Um, each day this week at 11.30, um, whether you're joining us online with, via our YouTube channel, and we know we've got people on there at the moment, so good morning and welcome to you all, or whether you're going to come into church and join us here for our talks. This morning, I, it's my pleasure to introduce David Starling, Sparling, who came, comes to us hotfoot from Colchester. Now, David has been a bell ringer for many years and is also a, a friend of our bell ringers, so I'm very pleased that he's here today to lead our talk on, well, all about bells. So I'm going to hand over now to David and uh, may we show our appreciation in the normal way. Thank you. Good morning. Um, few of you will know me because I'm not very famous. Um, those that do know me may well have heard much of this before at length, for which I apologise. Um, some words of introduction. My name is David Sparling and I am a bell ringer. I was born and bred in Kirby in the northeast corner of Essex and I learnt to ring there in 1968 in the company of my twin brother John. I left Kirby in 1977 to attend the University of London and while I was there I joined the University of London Society of Bell Ringers. This gave me the opportunity to ring on 10 and 12 bells and in fact I had the chance to ring with some of the very best ringers in the world. For the avoidance of doubt I am not one of them. I came back to Kirby after university. I became tower captain from 1985 until 1997. I'm a past master of the Essex Association of Change Ringers, a group of some 1,200 ringers, uh, and I held that position from 93 to 98. I represented Essex on the Central Council of Church Bell Ringers, which is the representative body of ringers across the world. I've rung for Essex at inter-county competitions. I've rung in national 12-bell competitions. I've rung at towers in England, Scotland, Ireland, Wales, USA, Canada, Australia, and New Zealand. I'm now a member of ART, the Association of Ringing Teachers, and I help teach people how to teach people to ring. I even met my wife, a bell ringer, on a bell ringing holiday in Charleston, South Carolina, USA, even though I had known her parents, both bell ringers, for some 15 years. So that's a slightly longer than average introduction, uh, but hopefully it sets the scene on something that has been a large influence on my life for the last 53 years. And this is sort of like one of those modern films where you have the end at the beginning and the rest of what I'm going to say is to try and explain to you what it is that has fascinated me all those years. So back to the beginning. Bells have been around for some 3,000 years. Um, back in 2000 BC, in the Bronze Age, people started mixing copper with tin and they found that the metal beaten into shapes had a resonance that they had not previously seen. The shape can change to a cowbell shape, then a basin, and then handbells. And bells, as they got bigger and bigger, had straps on the crown called cannons to hang them on. I have a picture here of, of an example. Now, this is a bell in Italy, but they're hung much the same way. Through the loops on the top, the cannons, they, um, they put straps and nailed them to large blocks of wood called headstocks. Initially, they used to hit the bells on the outside with bits of wood um, before the development of the internal swinging clapper that we see now. And the first Christian reference to bells was a call to matins way back in 422. By about the 12th and 13th century, the shape has evolved to pretty much what we know today. Subtle differences in the thickness and the shape 
occurred, and, and that allows historians to date older bells, even though the tradition of putting the dates on them didn't happen until the end of the 16th century. The medieval use of bells was as a main time signal, the ringing of a single bell with different bells used for different events marked the start and end of curfew, of the city gates opening and closing, uh, of markets opening and closing, as well as service times, and specific points in the service, such as the blessing of the bread and wine. It was the medieval equivalent of a text message with customised ringtones. Now, it's worth just thinking about how these bells were cast in the days before electric furnaces, low loaders and cranes. Bells are fiendishly difficult to pick up and very heavy, um, and so they needed to be cast locally. A large number of itinerant local founders uh, existed at that time, and they set up furn furnaces in the churchyard. They cast bells in the holes in the ground, and we see today references to Bell Field. They tuned them by chipping bits off the lip using a pointed hammer. The tuning of bells is a subject for a, a, a talk all on its own. The sound we hear from a bell is made up of about five different notes, and depending on where you take metal off the bells, it will change the balance between all of those notes. Very complicated. But over the years, these itinerant founders got much better at it and they began to cast peals of bells rather than individual ones, bells of different sizes that could be tuned to a musical scale. The oldest surviving peal of three dates from around mid 14th century. There are five 15th century bells still rung regularly at St. Lawrence in Ipswich, just down the road. Interesting to think that these same bells would have been heard by Cardinal Wolsey, Lord Chancellor to Henry VIII, who grew up in Ipswich, and they would have sounded exactly the same to him as they do to us today. Having learnt to cast these peals of bells, it was all very well, but you then had the challenge of ringing them. And how did you go about doing that? The problem is, if you have a bell hung like this, the big bells, which produce the low notes, swing very slowly. The small bells, which produce the high notes, swing much quicker. It's Newton's law of gravity, um, proportional to the square, le length, uh, the square root of the length. So you've got no control of it, they swing. And if you try and ring different size bells like that, you get the kind of noise that many of us will have woken up to on a Sunday morning in our continental Europe hotel room, where you just have this random clattering of different notes going on. So how do we overcome that? Well, in the second half of the 16th century, the, there was a lever that was attached to those metal parts there, and that got replaced with a half a wheel. And then the half a wheel got replaced by a three-quarter wheel, and that allowed a longer swing, and it allowed us to swing the little bells higher and the big bells not so high to try and even out those differences. By the 17th century, the three-quarter wheel appeared, and the first full wheel bell was installed at St Bartholomew by the Exchange in London in 1649. So what, I hear you say? Well, it was the development of the full wheel and full circle ringing that separates the English style of ringing to every other kind all over the world. It allowed the bells to be rung upside down from that which most people see on their Christmas cards. Here's a picture of a modern belfry. And you see the bells there are sitting mouth up and they're balanced on a small piece of wood called the stay. The stay is the only thing that stops that toppling over and they are just over the balance resting on the stay. 
There's a rope which goes through a hole in the floor and over a pulley and wraps around the wheel. In the floor below is a person hanging onto the end of the rope and as you pull that rope, the bell will swing over the balance and once it's over the balance, it goes all the way round. The secret is to pull the bell just hard enough so that it gets up to the top and stops. And then you pull it back and it goes up to the stop, top and stops again. That way, it is the ringer that is controlling the swing speed of the bell and not Newton's law of gravity. I've got a little video here just to try and demonstrate that for those who haven't seen it. So a word of explanation. I, I pinched this with pride off of the internet. So you can find this freely available. If you Google um, full circle ringing, you'll find a much longer version of this. Gentleman on the left is the ringer. He's downstairs. He's got the rope in his hand. On the right hand side, you see the bell. The bell is upwards. The rope is going round the wheel through the hole here. And we're going to set this man going. So by pulling the rope down, the bell swings up to the balance, hand stroke and at back stroke, the rope's up around the wheel, up to the top, then it comes and up to the balance again. Hand stroke again, rope goes into the air, bell swings round, and he's set the bell upwards, ready to go again. It's really easy, isn't it? Well, actually, no, it's not. Um, if you think about it, the average weight of a bell is not unadjacent to that of a small car. The heaviest bell here at St. Peter Mancroft is nearly two tonnes. That's a Ford Transit van in real money. So you have a Ford Transit van swinging through 360 degrees around its front wheel, and it's attached to a rope, which is about 70 to 100 feet long, and you've got a person on the other end of that rope. If you move up and down your hands on that rope by half an inch, you'll change the speed at which that bell rings. So it is absolutely critical. If you don't pull the rope quite hard enough, the bell will swing three quarters of the way round and fall back down, dropping 70 feet of rope on you. If you pull it too hard, the bell goes all the way over the balance, pings against the stay, bounces back, and drops 70 feet of rope on top of you. So the secret is to find that gap. It's easy to start and difficult to stop, as I found out 50 or so years ago. However, practice makes perfect. And the ringers at that time did a lot of practicing and they got very good at it. And they perfected the ability to ring the bells in sequence. One, two, three, four, five, six, if you've got six bells. You start at the highest note and you ring down the scale to the lowest row, note. And that's an order that we call rounds. And they learned to ring the bells in rounds and they practiced ensuring that the gaps were all beautiful, just like a convoy going down the motorway with six inches between the juggernauts um, as they're doing 70 miles an hour. You're trying to position the bells in exactly that even sequence. The next challenge came that the mathematicians tell you that if you've got five bells, you could ring them in 120 different orders. So why do you just ring one, two, three, four, five? Why not ring any of the other changes? If you've got six bells, it goes up to 720. Seven is 5,040. Eight is 40,320. By the time you get to 12 bells, like here, there are some 470 million different changes that you could create with 12 bells. Um, that, in case you're interested, about 38 years of non-stop ringing. So what they started to do is they started to change the order manually to, call, to, to make some of these different orders. 
And that was okay, we call that call changes, and we still do it today. However, alongside that, they also introduced the idea of changing automatically, that the bells, one time after another, just automatically rang in a different order. And there's evidence of that happening around about 610. In 668, a gentleman with a very strange name of Fabian Stedman produced a book with an even stranger name called Tintinologia. Actually, it was written by a guy called Richard Duckworth of Oxford, but it was Stedman that stamped his name on the front cover. And it was the first book on bell ringing. And it set out the rules for these changes. There were four of them, really, and they're really quite simple. Rule number one, you always start in descending order. We talked about that. We call that rounds. In each row after that, so as each time you change the order, in each row, each bell rings once and once only. So everyone gets the same number of goes. Rule number three, as you move from one row to another, each bell is only allowed to change one place in the row. So if this go, you were the third bell to ring, the next time you could be the second bell to ring, or the third, or the fourth. Thou shalt not move to one, thou shalt not move to five or any further. So only move one place. The fourth one, which I'll talk about in a little more detail a little later, is you must not repeat a row until you get back to rounds. That's a big no-no. We call that false. It's said to be false. You must not repeat a row until you get back to rounds. Those four rules are the basic rules that we use today. Created 1668, adhered to today. They sound quite simple, but actually following them, you can generate literally tens of thousands of different patterns. And one of those earliest patterns was defined in Duckworth Stedman's book. Uh, it was called 20 All Over. We're going to have a quick look at that to see how those rules are put into place. So, 20 All Over. We start in rounds, one, two, three, four, five. So we're just going to look at this in five bells. The first change that um, 20 all over defined was that we would swap over bells one and two. So that follows our rules, only moved one place. The two rings first, followed by the one. The next change, we're going to swap the one with the three. Again, that follows our rules. And the next change, we'll swap the one with the four. Now this was done automatically. No one called these out, you had to remember them. And then we moved the one with the five. So now we've got two, three, four, five, one, and the one is gone from being the first bell to ring, one at a time, going all the way to the back. Having done that, we start again at the front of the change, and we swap over two and three. And then we swap the two and the four, and then the two and the five. You're getting the idea of this, I'm sure. Um, so we'll just do one more. The three and the four does the same. The three and the five, the three and the one, and the three and the two. And we end up with four, five, one. And then we start with the four and five, and we complete them. And here we are, if you count them all up, there are 20 changes, and we come back. One, two, three, four, five. You can either do a quick check yourself or you can take my word for it. This does not repeat any of the changes. So it all works. 20 all over. Now, while a very simple pattern to learn, actually it's quite hard to ring because a lot of the bells do nothing. They stay in the same place for a long while while others are mucking about and then all of a sudden you have to wake up. It's a bit like the percussion player in an orchestra who can go out the back for a quick cigarette and come back in, but you'd better put those cymbals in the right place when you come back in. And this was very much along that. So in 1677, just nine years after the publication of Tintinologia, Stedman wrote his own book. Catchy title, Campanologia, as this one was called, and it showed clearly the development in 
change ringing that had happened in just those few years. And it introduced the concept of what Stedman called cross changes. This is where more than one bell moves at any one time. And it's much more similar to what we do today. We have a quick look at one example of those. It's called Plain Hunt. And we're going to do it on six bells. So again, we start in rounds one, two, three, four, five, six. This time, instead of just crossing over one and two, we're going to cross over three and four as well, and five and six as well. No bells moved more than one place, so we're still within the rules. If we were to do that again, of course, that would be silly, because that would just bring us back to one, two, three, four, five, six. So instead of crossing the major pairs, we're going to cross the inside pairs this time, and one and four cross over, and six and three cross over. Then we'll go back to the major pairs, and then the minor pairs, and we carry on doing that. Outside pairs, inside pairs, outside pairs, inside pairs, and after 12 changes, it comes back into rounds. And again, you can check all of those. Now this is much more exciting because all the bells are moving and weaving. And if you take the crosses away and you draw a line through where each bell goes, you find the one works its way from the front of the change, one blow at a time, to the back, just as we did in 20 all over. But the difference this time is the others are moving as well. The two goes into the front of the change and then all the way to the back and two blows at the back and then in again. And this pattern is repeated, in fact, for all the bells. All the bells do exactly the same thing, but they just start in a slightly different place. And all of those lines, when you lay them on top of each other, are like one of these Chinese rings that they all fit together beautifully. But they only fit together beautifully if everybody's in the right place at the right time. And this is called plain hunt. And this is the basis of change ringing today. How do you learn it? You have to commit it to memory. As I say, thou shalt not have any visual aids. That could be rule five. We really frown on the idea of having the blue line in front of you. So you have to learn that pattern. And that's quite a simple one. But if we continue Stedman's ideas and those rules, the patterns can get quite complicated. Uh, in the interests of full disclosure, I should say, this is by far from being the most complicated pattern that ringers today ring. But it's a good example, and it fits nicely on a single PowerPoint slide. Some of the others get so complicated that you can't actually read them. You have to learn that. And most of the ringers here would be able to write that line out from memory. Here's the next challenge, though. Even the most complicated of patterns will repeat after a certain number. Okay, so we saw our 20 all over came back into rounds after 20 changes. Our plain hunt came back into rounds after 12 changes. The problem is, and, and, and so for example, let's say on seven bells, a standard pattern on seven bells repeats after 84 changes. Now, 84 is way, way short of the 5,040 possible different orders. So how do we get our 5,040 if our pattern repeats after 84? Well, this comes down to one of the ringers called the conductor. He puts calls in at certain places in the pattern, which causes certain bells to do something different. So however complicated that pattern was, when a call is put in, you do something different just for one blow, and then you go off and you start to ring the pattern again. And what that does is it shunts bells around mathematically, if you like, and it gives you another set of 84 changes. But you have to put another call in before the 84 is up, otherwise you'll start to repeat again. So you have to work out where to put those calls in, you have to put the calls in and you have to rely on all the ringers to do what they're told at that point. 
Now, that allowed people to ring longer and longer pieces. Instead of it repeating every 84 changes, they could ring multiple combinations of 84 changes and make it last longer. Appeal was defined as a set of 5,000 or more changes. So that's about three hours of ringing, roughly. And in the 1700s, the race was on to find a way to generate all 5,040 changes possible on seven bells and to ring them one after the other with one band. That race was won here at St Peter Mancroft. The first peal rung anywhere in the world was rung here on the 2nd of May, 1715. It took them three hours and 18 minutes. There is a magnificent peel board here um, displayed in the tower which commemorates that achievement. It doesn't do it justice on here, but if you get, ever get a chance to visit the tower, uh, go and have a look at it. It's wonderfully uh, ornate. It is a fantastic achievement, and the Norwich ringers were led by a man called John Gartham. And John Gartham was the man that cracked the code to work out how to, to map your um, pastry cutter of 84 changes, to cut out blocks of 84 changes and use up all 5,040 changes on your pastry board without any overlaps and without any missing. And he did it. He was a Norwich weaver. Other members of the band, Robert Crane, was an alehouse keeper. Henry Howard was a worsted weaver. William Callow was an innkeeper. These were not learned gentlemen, but they achieved something that nobody else had ever done. They also did it against fierce competition, particularly from ringers in London. It would be fair to say that there are some people, mainly in London, who claim that there had been an early appeal in London before the Norwich one. There are no records of that, and Norwich's view is, well, they would say that, wouldn't they? The fact is that we know exactly what the Norwich men rang. We know the method, the pattern, we know the composition, where the calls were made, and we know who rang. Uh, everything about it is recorded. In fact, it's recorded in such detail that on the 300th anniversary of that first peal, there were a number of bands, myself included, that reproduced their achievement exactly. All 5,040 changes, all in the same order, all using exactly the same plan as John Garthen had put together 300 years earlier. To prove it was no flash in the pan, the Norwich ringers, three years later, rang the first peal ever of another method called Grants of Triples, 26th of August, 1718. No one had ever done that before, and that was a rather more complicated pattern than their first one. 13 years after that, they rang the first peal of Stedman's own method on seven bells called Stedman Triples, 25th of October, 1731. And there are peal boards for each of those as well, which mimic that first peal. The Norwich ringers were highly respected across the country. In fact, they were asked to go and ring at the opening of various bells across the country, including new peal of 10 bells at York Minster. They started also a trend. They rang the very first peal. In 2019, which was the last year of full ringing before COVID hit us, anyone remember COVID? 4,540 peals were rung across the world. So it is something which has really taken off. And every single one of those follows those rules that we defined in uh, Tintinologia all those years ago. I talked before about rule four and falseness, just as a little aside and, and an example. In 1923, at Southwark Cathedral, 
a band rang 12,675 changes of Stedman's method on 11 bells called Stedman Sinks. 12,675. It took them nine hours and 47 minutes non-stop. If you learn that the heaviest bell at Southwark is around 50 hundredweight, two and a half tons, someone rang that two and a half ton bell for nearly 10 hours. It was a massive physical effort as well as a mental effort to keep that pattern in your head for that length of time and not to go wrong. There's a wonderful peel board in Southwark Cathedral commemorating this. Underneath it is a tiny little plaque that was added 13 years later. One night, somebody was just musing through the figures of that record peel, and they discovered it was false. Six changes, six changes out of the 12,675, that's about three, four seconds ringing, was repeated. And nine hours and 47 minutes of ringing was removed from the record books. The peel board's still there just to remind people that you really do need to check. So in some ways, that's the fascination. Whether you ring for whole peels or just short touches at your local tower, it is that combination of physical skill to get the bell to sound at exactly the right time, despite the fact that it might weigh as much as a Ford Transit, and you've got 70 foot of rope. The thing that you wouldn't have seen from that swinging bell is the bell sound does not happen until the bell is three quarters of the way round the swing. The clapper catches up with the bell as the bell rises and it sounds then. So it's a second and a bit after you pull. So to get your bell to sound in the right place, you actually have to anticipate where that place is going to be. It's like spotting the gap on a roundabout. If you wait until the gap is in front of you in your car, you've missed it. You've got to see it coming, you've got to anticipate, and you've got to be moving into that gap. So it is with the bell. You've got to know where your bell has got to go, and you've got to be able to put it there. And alongside that, you have the mental uh, effort to coordinate that physical activity with the complex methods. You've got to pull that pattern out of your head. It's got to be coming all the time. And if you need to move your heavy bell forward in the row, you must not pull the previous blow quite so hard. So you've got to be able to prejudge where you're going to move next in order to adjust your pull on this blow to get the next one in. Again, like snooker players are always thinking one blow ahead. You've got to know where you want the cue ball to be for the next shot in order to know how to play this one. And you're doing this every second. It's just moving all of the time. You've got to be able to put your bell within a tenth of a second for it to sound right. And perhaps the greatest fascination of all is it's the ultimate team sport. If you want to ring eight bells, you need eight ringers. Everyone has the same number of goes. So you're only as good as your weakest link. One person out of time will destroy the rhythm. On the other hand, if you've just taken part in a piece of ringing that sounded really nice, you can be justifiably proud that you did your bit. No one gets a free ride. No superstar or prima donna can create a sparkling piece of ringing on their own like they may score a try at rugby or a goal at football. You need everybody to be on their game for that to work well. And that is true whether you ring peels or whether you just ring for Sunday services and whether you're a superstar or just an average ringer like myself and whether you're young or whether you're old. It's a fascinating thing. And today, if we come right up to present, 
there are some 6,184 peals of bells of four or more hung for full circle ringing. Over 6,000 peals of bells hung for full circle ringing. This is how they're distributed across the world. Um, for those watching online who are bell aficionados, I should say, those figures include bells listed as unringable. So uh, they may not be able to be rung today because of problems with the tower or the frame or whatever, but um, the pattern remains the same whether you include or exclude unringable bells. Of that 6,000 odd, 5,777 of them are in England. Only 149 are outside of the UK. That's 2%. It is a great English tradition and then a British tradition. All those bells outside the UK are where the, the, the English have settled. USA, South Africa, Australia, New Zealand, all the places I mentioned in my introduction. Every single one of those sets of bells is recorded in an online database. We love recording things, bell ringers, we love it. Um, that online database is referred to as Dove. If you Google Dove's Guide, you can find it and, and you can look anywhere uh, in the world at what bells they've got. Um, it's referred to Dove because it's named after Ron Dove, who was the English gentleman who produced the original book version. He, he produced uh, uh, Dove's Guide in 1950. This online database records where the bells are, how many are in the tower, when they were cast, by whom, the individual weights and notes of every bell, whether they're currently ringable or not, as I talked about before, what night they practice, whether they're accessed on the ground floor where you have to go up a staircase, and whether or not they have a loo. Also very important as you get older. Everything a ringer could need is recorded in Dove's Guide. It's an extremely important record of our heritage as well as the must-have guide for any ringer travelling the country. And to put that into context, if you rang at a different church for every Sunday morning service, you'd be going for well over 100 years before you got round the ones even in England. And here at St Peter Mancroft, it is but one of those 6,184 peals of bells. It's important because back in 1715, um, that very first peal was rung. Back then, however, Mancroft only had eight bells and they were hung, they were rung from a gallery right up in the tower. In 1724, they added two more bells to the eight to make them into a ten. Unfortunately, they couldn't afford them and they couldn't, and they couldn't pay for them, so they took them back again. Um, eight years later, in 1736, again they put two new bells in. Um, they could afford to pay for them, but they didn't like them, and they were rejected as not agreeable, as the um, wording went at the time. Uh, and so, in third time lucky, in June of 1736, they finally became a ten. Those bells were replaced by a new ring of twelve, which was installed in 1775. And the Mancroft bells that you hear across the city today are the same as those in 1775, except for the tenor, which was replaced in 1814. They are the oldest surviving ring of 12 in the country. Um, not the first, that was York, but they've been replaced. And the heaviest peal of bells in East Anglia. In 1982, as part of the Victorian reordering, that original ringing gallery was removed and the bells were then rung from a floor lower down, uh, about level with the bottom of the organ now. Um, that added about 20 feet to the length of the rope and given that the, the um, tenor is a couple of tons, uh, that made them a formidable prospect. They were, by the by, they were the very first peal of 12 I ever rang on as a young lad and I visited here with the guy who taught me to ring and I remember being scared out of my wits. Um, the, the length of the rope as you looked 
up through the tower uh, was truly daunting, and they were not for the faint-hearted. Additional bells were added in 1909 and 1997 to give greater flexibility and allow people to ring lighter combinations of bells um, because a two-ton tenor on that length of rope was, as I say, not for everyone. 300 odd years on from that groundbreaking achievement in 1715, the Mancroft ringers here today are still at the forefront of ringing. In 2015, to, um, to mark the 300th anniversary, a very ambitious project was initiated, and that involved restoring the original ringing gallery back up in the tower. And if you, when you go out, if you look above the organ, you can see now where the ringers uh, ring from. Uh, they recycled the old Victorian opening, and they opened it up again, and they reused that. So it's back exactly where it was uh, when those uh, world-beating uh, ringing was going on. Um, at the same time, they did some significant strengthening of the frame. Uh, the 12 bells here have a total weight of around nine tonnes. And if you think you have nine tonnes swinging through 360 degrees, that has quite an effect on a tower. In fact, the vertical force on the tower is about five times the static weight. So that's 45 tonnes of loading down. But more significantly, the horizontal force is twice the static weight. So you've got 18 tonnes going sideways. Um, so what they did when they did that project is they put some significant steel work in. This is it on the ground before it goes up. And then that was bolted across the top of the frame to stiffen the whole frame up and stop it wobbling uh, as that went on. Um, that, together with the, um, the new ringing gallery, which is here, so that's a view from up there looking this way, um, have made the bells much, much easier to ring. They're still two ton, but they're much more controllable than they were. It gives the ringers a magnificent view of the church here, but it also gives people in the nave here a view of the ringers and when you go out again you'll see the ropes hanging up there and on Sunday mornings you'll see the ringers up there performing in front of the, the whole congregation. Along with the reordering upstairs, the post-Victorian ringing room was reused and it is now the home of the Mancroft Ringing Discovery Centre. This is a state-of-art tra training centre for teaching new ringers. There's a view just before it was completed. It's one of only three of its kind across the world. It is the most recent and arguably the very, very best equipped. It is, actually, we just go back to that. Um, in that octagon at the top are eight training bells, and each one of those training bells looks like this. It's not a real bell, it's a lump of metal hung on a wheel. It weighs a fraction of the amount of a real bell, but it moves, it's hung in such a way that its movement is exactly the same as a real bell, and it allows us to teach people for as young as six or seven on these bells in a way that you could never have hoped to have done on the heavy bells, on the main bells. Each one of those training bells is connected to a laptop. That allows us to have specific training sessions for eight ringers, all at the same time, all doing their own thing and the laptop takes the place of the seven other ringers that you might need. So no longer do we need loads and loads of experienced ringers to help teach people. Equally, the eight bells can be rung as a conventional ring with eight ringers, but all the sound is produced digitally and it makes no noise outside so it doesn't annoy the neighbours. So it gives us much longer chance to ring. Nikki Thomas, who many of you might know, ringer here, is the manager of the um, MRDC. 
They hold regular drop-in sessions for anyone, um, usually around lunchtime, uh, and I encourage you, if you're in any way interested, to um, go along there and, and have a look. And there you have it, really, 400 plus years after the idea of full circle ringing was invented, um, the traditions that were founded way back then live on. The rules and regulations that covered that first peel in 1715 are identical to those that are still in place today. We ring the same methods that Stedman invented all those years ago, alongside ones that are brand new. We ring on bells that are hundreds of years old, hung alongside those with modern castings. We cast and hang bells in very much the same way as we did those hundreds of years ago, but we've found new man-made materials, particularly for ropes that are much stronger and have no stretch and give us much better control over those bells. And we have computerized technology helping to teach new generations about a centuries old tradition. And so perhaps bell ringing has something to teach us all. Um, how to accept the opportunities that modern life gives us without abandoning the heritage, treasures and traditions of the past. Thank you very much for listening. Um, I think all of us, whether we've been online or whether we've been sitting in church this, uh, this, this morning, have learnt so much about bell ringing from David, um, and he put it over in such a clear and concise way that perhaps we could maybe um, understand what he was on about. We've learned about rounds, we've learnt about 1649, five, five bells with 120. 20 different possibilities. We've heard about somebody called Fabian Stedman. And then, of course, we've heard about the importance of St. Peter Mancroft in the history of bell ringing. When he was doing those numbers, I did sit there myself, and I was slowly but surely, and some of you may have noticed me handing a note to the person looking after our digital system this morning, and the note said, I'm lost. So you, it's obviously a very mathematical thing and it's something which um, I would aspire to do, but I know my limitations. So I've had a go in the MRDC and would encourage, if you've never been before, to have a go and have a look at it. Do look online on the St. Peter Mancroft website where you'll find diff uh, details about it. On your behalf, thank you so much, David, for coming and also for giving us such an interesting talk this morning. And also, of course, tomorrow, the same time, same place at 11.30, we have a talk about of tokens and traders. And this is being led by Dr. Adrian Marsden, and he'll be taking us through that period of Norwich history in the 17th century, when small change ran out, and many of the traders locally issued their own tokens in the form of small money tokens some of which are buried here at St. Peter Mancroft. There's also an exhibition as well in our church, so I'd encourage you to perhaps have a look at that. And that was a special treat this morning. And for those who are physically able to, um, my assistant has gone to get the key to the tower, and um, we will open up so you can go and have a look at the MRDC if you've not been up there. And also, we'll take you up to the top floor where the ringing chamber is as well, which is the place for the selfie with the wonderful view of the church in the background. So if you'd like to, you'd be very welcome to. Obviously, I will say wear masks and take your time on the steps for which there are many. But once again, the bottom line, thank you, David.